Thank you. Our brother has asked a very important question. Would you like to attempt it? What do you think causes it? Why? What makes intolerance? What makes people to listen outside when it comes to their wives or to their husbands? Maybe on two counts. The first thing I discover is that sometimes there is a lot of presumptions. A lot of assumption. Ah, she should know now. She should understand. Even if the church member doesn't understand, she should understand. Not knowing that the two of us are together to actually grow together and help each other along on the journey. But we expect that there should be you know, there are some expectations that you think should have been there. It should be there. She should understand. Not knowing that we are to build this understanding and this relationship together. Many assumptions have led to costly assumptions that, you know, while you are seeming to have a good relationship with church members, you don't have it at home because of these costly assumptions. If the husband recognizes his, his um, roles, especially towards the wife, as stated in that Ephesians that we read, you will also again discover that certain things that you assume that your wife understands or she doesn't understand is actually the reason for your coming together so that you will have a ministry to her life. But now when you deny her that ministry, it becomes a problem. That's the first thing. These are assumptions that could be costly. The second issue is that um, the male and the female have two different views about the home. The male, you know, when Jesus said, he who made them in the beginning, made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. He didn't make them male and male. He didn't make them female and female. So the expectations that a male has of a female is like he's expecting the female to be a male. But the male is different from the female. And as I was saying, you rightly said, when you come home, you expect that the home should be a place of rest. That's a man. I think it was the other time that we were reading something, a, a, a study that was carried out about the, difference, the differences between the sexes in terms of their outlook, their, their perception, their understanding. A male normally understands the home as a place to rest and relax. It's not a place to do anything. But the female recognizes the home as a place to relate and build relationship. So as soon as you come back, she wants to build a relationship. But as soon as you come back, you want to rest. And the male and the female must be one. These two must be one flesh. So that means there is an understanding that First Peter chapter 3, 7 says that let the husband uh, dwell with their wives according to knowledge, with understanding that she is a weaker sex. There is an understanding of the female that the man must have. And there is an understanding of the male that the woman must have. So that the two can help one another and give way. You don't have to insist on your male view if you are going to be one. There must be a blending, a submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, the other aspect is that in any other relationship, 
that we have outside either with church members or with anybody there is there is a gradient that is to say that the person that you are counseling is having a sense of indebtedness are you understanding but your wife somehow believes that your relating with her is an obligation i don't know why you understand that's why sometimes you will hear a wife say if you know you are not going to talk to me why did you marry me have you had a wife saying something like that before now why did she say that because she believes that actually it is an obligation on your part to do what you are doing. So when she asks you a question, she expects an answer not as a good gesture. She expects it as what? As an obligation. It's the obligation of our marital relationship. So unconsciously, everywhere you went, they related with you from an angle of respect an angle where it is not my right but thank you for listening to me do you understand but at home your wife does not think she believes that it is your duty to do what to listen that it was an obligation of marriage and that who else should I talk to if not you you will hear her say if I don't talk to you who do you want me to talk to I don't know how you understand that now so that's the matter so the reason why the marital relationship is the best place to test humility submission love is that that is a relationship on the horizontal level that demands an obligation rather than a favor and men many times we only survive where we are being adulated where you are being put up there and then you can dish but here the wife is saying please uh, i respect you as my husband but you should know that you are the father of these children <laughs> did, you, did you know what she's saying now you know that if you brought a uh, one thousand naira and you gave somebody in church as a help what does that person do Ah, thank you very much. Oh, because she's not expecting it. If you bring a thousand naira and you give your wife, look, if she was polite to say thank you, she only said that thank you, not because <laughs> she may turn around and say, hey, so what do you want us to do with this one thousand? So. <laughs> <laughs> now that is reminding you that look oh, your relationship with me is not first a benevolence it's an obligation it is that obligatory aspect of our marriage that we have not known how to handle together that usually brings the rift do, do you understand now if somebody is coming to me for counseling and i'm dozing i'm doing like this and i'm tired first he say, ah i'm sorry for disturbing you i'm sorry for disturbing you isn't it then you may say well it's okay it's okay uh god bless you because she has already said i'm sorry for disturbing you something you say at least she knows that it is not her right and i'm only just helping her then you can give but 
Sometime you are, you are doing like this, and your wife came and said, Look, we need to talk. There's a matter here. Are you still sleeping? <laughs> eh? Are you still sleeping? We need to talk. Eh? Sit down, let's talk before you sleep. It's not time to sleep. Ah! Why is she doing that? She thinks it is her right. It is an obligation you owe her. Now, do you know that nobody manifests anger where he is highly head in ISD? Isn't it? Uh -huh. So that doesn't show that you have overcome anger. But it is when somebody is demanding what you are obliged to do and that even when you have done it if she says thank you she's only being extra polite after all it is what you ought to do if at that point you are able to exercise spirituality it means ritual so what I'm trying to note here is that if we succeed with this woman that God had given you to marry, I can tell you, you will succeed with any other person all over the world by the grace of God. So, we are beginning to note that our relationship with our wives, it is not, it is both voluntary but obligatory. And the obligation of our relationship together is what brings us to have to face the fact of okay, okay when she talks like that she's not rude she's only asking what is correct for her to demand i don't know whether we have tried to answer the question a bit yes do i ask uh, do you think that these languages of a thing or the words used in the family you, the, the, that's either by the husband or by the wife do you think he is being prompted by the enemy because you say something that it is in the home that is the attitude in the home that gives true picture of the man either that he is a Christian or that he is not a Christian and then you know these two people call themselves a Christian and then preachers and I expected to, to show to leave it out so that those people that they are congregating will see and imitate and then eventually you see that the, the home is being covered up somehow the woman either may use words it's a right to talk to her husband and then the language I don't know do you think the enemy is putting the language in their their mouths because you see, and there is a this and it will adage that say that you give the heart meat. I mean, you give her meat, you give the heart meat, you refuse. Give her money, you refuse. And when you say sorry, you takes it. So, a place where that language ought to be seasoned so as to suit the family, don't you think? The, 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 an intruder is bringing the word. That's what I'm asking because I think the problem is in the words. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, our brother simply said that. Now, you see, I, I would like to agree with you on what you have said, but just like I put, do you know that Philippians chapter 4 simply says, let no let no word except that which is seasoned with salt that we minister grace to the hearer. Isn't it? Now, if we were to keep practicing that, which is an instruction to all Christians, and we do it in our house, that every word that I will say to my wife or to say to my husband must minister grace to him. 
we going to have a good relationship at all? Eh? That's what I'm saying. All the principles of Christian living that we have read, that we try to practice outside, where God will want us to begin to experience it by just being Christians is to do it first where it matters most in our homes. So that if a wife is going to talk to her husband, she's asking the words that is coming out of my mouth now. To see minister grace. Or to see damage her. Or to see damage him. If we would just go through what the word of God says. Just to be a Christian. You will see that our home will produce the same result we are talking about. Praise the Lord. Now there's one hand I saw in front here before I go away. There's one more hand. Yes. Let's take uh, Mrs. Pofi. Here. I, I just want to read a text before I make the point. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 8 to 10. Let your garment always be white, and let your head lack no oil. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun. All your days of vanity. For well, that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Praise the Lord. I, I just want to say that we are grateful to God for what he is helping us to understand. Uh, he talked of patience as one of the additional reasons why hus husbands find it hard to be patient, to listen to their wives is we've got to the point that we don't value each other as much. I remember one of our brothers when he was looking for his wife, he said he traced, he traced, he traced where she was going and where her journey will end because he was interested in her. He trusted, he spent time. He continued to watch out until he caught her. If we will put in even one quarter of the effort we put in when we were looking for our spouses, the marriage will work. I want to see here that if your head lacks no oil, that is your spiritual work, your devotional life is correct. At that place you receive conviction that you have not been patient. At that place you will receive conviction of how you are handling your wife or your husband. And if you sort it out with God, you will naturally come and sort it out with your spouse. And that is the bridge that our brother mentioned yesterday evening. You mentioned the bridge in the course of discussion. If you are spiritual, if you have come out from your closet and God has spoken to you god has dealt with your life the first test the first people to enjoy what god has done in your life is your wife and children when they test it and they are rejoicing then you can balance out and go to ministry and they are very happy sending you off to go and minister to those women in church those ones that normally it's so easy to be kind to uh, the place is the most difficult place to live the Christian life is the home because nobody is pretending and Christians are not supposed to pretend and if we are not supposed to pretend then we live correctly at home as Christians then when we go outside we are not pretending we will be living correctly so I see it's a challenge the key is our spiritual work if we are working right with God, we will live right with each other. Thank you for this input. Praise the Lord. Any other? Yes, sir. Please come this way to the admission. Rabili, I want to be brief. Because I think that tonight, this evening, you have hit on something um, in my heart and 
Gloria and I were chatting over it. And we believe strongly that there is need for prayer here. Um, I know, as most of us know, that any civilization that will collapse begins to manifest from the family. And there is a great misfortune befalling the church. Not because of the questions that have been raised, but because of my work and I know it. There is a massive deceit. A massive deceit amongst pastors. And the young ones are learning in error. And you can see what we have. Family life is not taken as seriously as the development of individual spiritual life. Whereas they all are the same. We want to know the Bible, we want to get a PhD in Bible, we want to... But family life is the same thing. If you want to know God and you cannot develop your family, you've wasted all, any other development. And I think you hit it right on the head. We were laughing because through the grace of God, we've come through this school for a while. And it took 25 years before my wife will ever tell me that I'm a Christian. 25 years of marriage. It is in the 25th year she once looked at me and she said, Ben, I think you are a Christian. <laughs> and that's a hard job. <laughs> but four years ago, she raised the question with me. And she was leading an ordination retreat. She raised the question with me. She said, this is what the Lord led her. And she said, where is Mrs. Ellie? And you know, with all my theology, I looked all the books, I looked all the commentaries, Mrs. Ailey was absent. Samuel came from 400 kilometers to benefit in Ailey's house. Mrs. Ailey was not there. Ailey himself, the archbishop, missed it all. His children missed it. Another child benefited. Brethren, we in the clergy, this is a serious matter. We're imitating the wrong things. Our wives are competing for the wrong reasons. The husbands are running after the wrong things. Instead of developing a home and providing a spiritual security for the next generation so that God's blessing, which he said to those who love him, is to the third and to the fourth generation. Right now, at the first generation of clergy house, they are gone. Sir, I think we need to pray. This is a serious issue. Yes, with the questions that have been raised and testimonies that have been given, it shows that we are treading already on dangerous ground. It's a serious matter. The development of the home is a very, very critical matter. I was made bishop at 36. I almost missed it. I had to make up my mind and say every one o'clock I will come home, I will have lunch with my wife, with my young children. And every five o'clock, no matter who you are, if you bring a case to my house, I will only be polite to listen to you, but case closed. I'm not hearing. If you have business, meet me in the office the next day. So that I can be a father. Thank God the diocese in 18 years has accepted it. They know it. Nobody brings a case at home after five. Nobody will disturb my family life. And everyone knows when I close, I'm at home so that I can be with my wife and with my children. If we don't do that, our civilization we're building now, whether it's church civilization or political civilization, having suffered all the persecutions will end up with nothing. Thank you for this input. Let me... I thought I should take an input from a lady. Is there a lady somewhere that wants to speak to us? No lady. There's one man there. He's also a man. Only men are speaking this night. I'm looking for a lady. But only men are speaking to me. Yes, the brother is somewhere there. Your wife is not here. No, no, you you have to bring your wife to us next time. You will jump three times for not bringing your wife. <laughs> yes? Uh, thank you, big brother. This, this whole issue... I don't know, but it's as if we are pointing at the man, 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 
man, everything coming from the man angle, as if he's the sole problem of the family not standing. He but, is not. Uh, but I, I know what I'm saying. I've seen cases where the man is the one complaining that he tries to create a venue of discussion with the wife, but the lady is not giving in. So not available. Let us see how we can balance it and bring in the concept of reciprocation in this thing. That it is reciprocal. Thank you. That was why I'm waiting for women to help us contribute to what we are talking about. Now, but what we are saying, brother, let me say it before we go away. We take a lady quickly. But let me say that we are not actually uh, overemphasizing man at all. Actually, we are simply speaking of the challenges we are speaking about the challenges. And when we will have time and we are reading the passage, you will see that on both sides, if the wife will be a Christian and if the husband will be a Christian, the way we are talking at home, our marriages will be okay. all right. It is any time you see a marital disharmony, it is just that somebody is not behaving as what the Christian that he ought to be. And what we are noting here is the fact that we sincerely don't have any excuse to be great Christian outside and bad brothers at home. Great uh, sisters outside and bad wives at home is not correct. So we are not particularly blaming men here or exonerating women but what I'm trying to note here is that if we will act in the way the word of God is teaching us you will see that a lot of our marital situations will be dealt with the emphasis we are simply raising is that a man's home is the, is the litmus test of his spirituality. We are not talking much of women, not because they don't have something that is also a challenge. We are going to speak about that later on. But let me take an input from that lady who is willing to share with us. Where is she? Praise the Lord. Amen. I just Amen. want to add something to what you have just said to our brother. Addressing us is not only addressing the men. When they are talking to the men, in the other side of it, we women, we should do what? Adjust ourselves and look at it from our own angle, too. Like our daddy said the word last time. He said, when the man returns from work, when he's tired, he's stressed up, he lies down, he will tell him, I want to see you. Or I want to discuss with you. Your manner of approach matters a lot. I want to see you. We have an important issue. That case is different. That I want to see you. Ah, it's like tearing up, uh, increasing the wahala. Praise the Lord. And if we should say, let us throw stone up in this place. The stone will first of all knock on top of our head, hit our head before we come to the neck, isn't it? <laughs> and the men at the head, the men at the head of our homes. When they are addressing you, accept your <laughs> part joyfully and amend. I believe that there is no woman in this place that will wake up one morning. Instead of you greeting your husband, you will, ask, you will tell him that, are you mad? I believe that woman that will bring her out for deliverance. Please, we as the children of God, we should amend our ways by receiving the word of God. Don't find fault that they are accusing the men, they are attacking the men. No. Just take your own. Then when it comes to the turn, the turn of the women, admit your own. One plus one, you, the home the, the will be joyfully. Praise God. Amen. So, let me read my Bible now. Can I? Let me read the Bible now. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let me find out. I'm just asking questions. When last did you practice this with your wife? Did you understand the question? I have read Ephesians verse 19, chapter 5. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've only asked when last did we think this is relevant in our marriage? Do you know that as simple as this is if this thing is done between you and your wife do you know that many many issues are resolved because you are creating an atmosphere. Do you know that you could not have finished singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, and there will be a matter that your wife or your husband wants to talk to you, and it will become an anger? Eh? Do you know that what brings all the friction of communication is actually that there is no atmosphere for communication. Eh? Oh, you are not understanding. So I'm just wanting to draw an issue tonight that what brings and produces harmony in our matrimony actually is not something strange. It's not something different. Is the same thing that God has taught us to do as Christians. That if we simply do it, even in our home, in our bedroom, we are going to get the same great result that God has promised us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, it is from that angle that I now want to begin to say, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God, wives, Submit yourself unto your own husband as unto who? As unto the Lord. It looks to me as if, if we are submissive to the Lord, you will just discover that the submission to a husband, because not to submit to your husband and to come and kneel and say, Oh Lord, I love you, God will say, ah, what I told you to do, you did not do it. What are you talking to me about? I just feel very simply tonight, uh, before we stop this, that the practice of our matrimony is nothing different from the practice of Christian living. That's the point I wanted to make. And I want to now say, and the right place, the best place, the correct place to practice Christian living and it will not be a stage drama is where? Is at home. Where there is no pretense. Where you can be simple. Where whatever you say, nobody is to be impressed. It's just the truth. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. I think we will call it a day at this point for tonight. If there is nothing that you want to raise, uh, we thank uh, the Archbishop for highlighting 
that issue for us again. So we're going to stop here. Uh, you would like to please lead us to pray on this. That we have touched and a little issue. It doesn't look big. But I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to emphasize that the home is the best place to prove your Christian experience. And that your wife, your husband, God has put them there to grow you where there is no pretense. To make you a genuine, authentic believer. Where you are not impressing anybody. May the Lord help us in this matter. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stop here as we pray together. Shall we pray together? I would like each one of us to first of all thank God for our homes. I want you to forget every difficulty first and say, Lord, I thank you for my home. Thank you for giving me the man you gave me. Thank you for giving me the woman you gave me. There is something that God has hidden in each other for ourselves. Let's thank God for that. We have heard that our homes are the testing grounds, the laboratories to test the authenticity of our Christianity. Without the home, we will just be hanging hypocrites, lives that are not tested, untested, untried, it will never last. God gave us our homes as a testing ground. Let's now pray that our homes will achieve that purpose. Since morning, the Lord has been speaking to us about the, 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 what the cross came to do in our lives. The cross as an instrument of terminating our human nature. That old life that will not live peaceably with anybody, even in the home. The cross is God's instrument to terminate it. I want us to pray that that instrument will work on our lives, even at home. When somebody dies in the hospital, we doctors, we don't believe that somebody has died until we have tested that fellow and proved it that indeed death has occurred. God put our wives with us and our husbands as the testing ground to test whether you are really dead. Whether the old life is actually dead. Whether the new life has actually come. You say, hey, she, she keeps provoking me. That's why I'm angry. It's because anger is inside. If it is Jesus that is inside, it's Jesus that will be provoked out. I want us to pray that indeed death will occur. Each of our lives, the death that the cross ministers it will be ministered to us so that the life also of Jesus will be made manifest in our mortal body.
I know God has not finished with us. Let's pray that as he continues to deal with us in this meeting, his hands will be heavy upon each of our lives. That we will not go back home the same. Let's thank God for hearing us. Our Father, we give you thanks this evening. Thank you, Lord, for coming to us the way you have done. Thank you for the issues that you have opened up to our lives. We sang a song at the beginning of this meeting this evening. Lord, give us Christian homes. I know heaven also is, is asking, Lord, let there be Christian homes on earth. Oh Lord, we are praying. Give us Christian homes in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we plead with you, what makes Christian homes are actually Christians as we have heard. We pray, oh God, that we will not only be Christians at work, Christians in church, we will be Christians at home in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, what that means is yet to be unfolded unto us. We plead with you that you will not leave us until that matter is dealt with. Help us, oh God, even as we go from here. Help our lives that what you made our homes to achieve in our lives will not be thwarted in the name of Jesus Christ. 